events uh, they were having. Um, I want to welcome you to this uh, co-sponsored program of the World Affairs Council and Marines Memorial Association. I'm Jane Wales, CEO of the Council, and I'm delighted to see you. Um, before we begin, just a quick word about Marines Memorial. Uh, for those who, uh, who don't know it well, um, it's a nonprofit organization. It's, um, it's chartered to honor the valor and the memory of those who served, those who lost their lives uh, in service of their country. And if you'd like to learn more about the organization and support the organization, uh, please do check online, marineclub.com. Uh, the Council, as you know, is a neutral forum for discussing critical international issues of the day. Uh, we're a membership organization, and if you're not yet a member, you can join by going on worldaffairs.org. Um, we are being recorded for radio tonight on KQED, so we want to give a special thanks to Jim Bennett, who's the recording engineer, uh, and also take this as your opportunity to turn off your cell phones so that that is not what's heard on the 8 p.m. show on Monday night. Thanks a lot. Um, during the format we're going to follow is that Secretary Cohen will be um, making formal remarks, then he'll join me for a conversation. That conversation will be informed by question cards from you. Um, I will integrate the cards uh, into what I hope will be a logical narrative, but uh, if not, forgive me for the lack of logic. But um, I urge you to use your quest, those blue question cards, and I urge you to use really good handwriting so I can, I can include your, uh, your questions. It's now my honor to introduce Secretary uh, William Cohen. William Cohen served as the 20th U.S. Secretary of Defense. He served during the Clinton administration um, after having had a distinguished service in the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives representing the state of Maine. Um, while he was Secretary of Defense, he oversaw increases in defense uh, spending as well as the reorientation of our military to adapt to the post-Cold War uh, world. Um, he also uh, sought to address problems of recruitment and retention as well as strengthening security relationships with friends around the world, again, to help them, uh, encourage them to reorient their defense posture uh, to take into account uh, modern day needs. Um, under his leadership, uh, the U.S. military conducted the, the wars in um, the largest air campaigns, really in Serbia and Kosovo, uh, and conducted military operations around the world. Since leaving the Department of Defense, Secretary Cohen has uh, headed up an organization called the Cohen Group, which is a global business and consulting firm uh, with offices all around the world covering issues um, as, as, as wide-ranging as he had to while he was in public service. Uh, he also launched the William S. Cohen Center for International Policy and Commerce at the University of Maine. Um, he's here to discuss uh, the global challenges facing the next administration, so please join me in welcoming Secretary William Cohen. Thank you very much, and now that I'm told we're live, I'll have to be very careful in my, uh, my informal remarks that I uh, delivered this evening, but uh, President Wells, thank you for your kind comments, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to this event. If you had trouble getting up, so did I. Uh, we blame it on Secretary Schultz, who's having an affair just one uh, floor below us, but there was quite a turnout uh, for uh, one of our truly great uh, uh, public servants. I had the occasion to, uh, to serve uh, when I was in the uh, House and Senate, and then at the, uh, uh, when he was Secretary of State, I uh, had a very um, a great relationship with him, and I didn't even have a chance to say hello, but uh, the elevator was packed, and uh, so we were lucky to get up here, so hope you had uh, some, hope you didn't have to walk up, uh, thanks. Um, Boris uh, Melnikov uh, is a young man over there who spent years with me in Washington, then he decided to find his fortune and go west, and he's here tonight. Uh, Boris, good to see you, uh, and wish you uh, well in the great state of California. Uh, whenever, I, I don't get to San Francisco very often, but I always feel a little bit like Henry Ford. You know, but, uh, Ford, when he, after he made all of his millions, he wanted to go back to his fatherland in County Cork, Ireland. And, of course, his reputation for wealth had long preceded his arrival, so when he finally got there, the town officials, uh, they came to him and asked him, as normal the case, for a contribution uh, to their uh, local hospital. And uh, Ford was quite accustomed to being touched in that fashion, and he pulled out uh, his checkbook. He made a checkout for $5,000. And then the next day in the local paper, it said in big, bold print, 
Ford contributes $50,000 for the construction of a local hospital. So the town officials came rushing back to him. They said, oh, Mr. Ford, terribly sorry. This was not our fault. It must have been a typographical error. We'll be happy to see to it the retraction is printed in tomorrow's paper. <laughs> and Ford said, wait a minute. I think I have a better idea. He said, you give me one wish, I'll give you the balance of 45000 That's one of those offers they couldn't refuse. So uh, they said, it's done whatever you want. He said, I want, when the hospital is finally completed, to have a quote over the entranceway taken from a, a source of my choice. So they said, it's done. He made the check out. The hospital was built. It's there today. And it has a plaque over the entranceway with a quote taken, I believe, from the book of Matthew. And it says, I came unto you as a stranger, and you took me in. So <laughs> I come unto you a little bit as a stranger tonight. Hope you'll take me in. Not quite that fashion. Um, I think a central issue for us to discuss tonight is uh, what's the role of government in our lives? That's what's going on with the presidential debate. What is the role that government should play in, uh, in our daily lives? Uh, it's a worthy debate to be sure, and you have two different approaches, basically two, two different philosophies, at least uh, on the domestic side. We'll talk about the foreign policy side perhaps in a moment. But um, when you talk about government, I always go back to Warren G. Harding. Uh, I pluck his name out of the pages of yesteryear, and Harding said that government is, after all, a very simple thing. And uh, some years later, FDR said there never was a more pathetic misapprehension of responsibility than in Harding's superficial conclusion, because we know it's not very simple, it's pretty complicated. And then it was Ronald Reagan, if I can uh, embrace um, Governor Reagan and President Reagan, uh, who said that um, government is like a baby's alimentary canal. It has a healthy appetite at one end and no sense of responsibility at the other. And I thought that was a pretty good definition in terms of where we find ourselves today, in terms of fiscal irresponsibility. It's something that I dealt with when I was a member of the House and the Senate. I, in fact, I gave my swan song. My final speech in the Senate was about the issues confronting us. And the central issue for me at that time was fiscal irresponsibility, that what we were doing, we were engaging in what I called um, basically fiscal child abuse, that we were inflicting, you know, uh, pain and suffering upon the generations that we don't see at this point but are going to feel those bruises in the years to come in the way of having to pay off that debt. And so fiscal responsibility is not a Republican issue or a Democratic issue. It's something that we should be restore a sense of fiscal sanity to our policies so we can re-energize the American economy and then be the force for good throughout the world. And that's a role that we have to play. And, and so I want to talk a little bit tonight, and I won't go too long because I am a former member of the United States Senate. As you know, they have unlimited uh, time uh, allotted. Uh, that as long as you can stand on your feet, you have the floor. Uh, unlimited debate, so uh, I will try not to do that. I have that temptation, and it can, apparently runs in the uh, just part of the job. Um, I thought I might uh, talk a little bit about uh, the what is the the role of the United States in the world. Uh, and when I was at the Pentagon, for example, um, we had to decide what should be the role of the the military. And I was very conscious about uh, a book that was written by Richard Haas at that time. It was called The Reluctant Sheriff. And I felt that that was really the role that we needed to be a reluctant sheriff, very reluctant to commit our uh, fine young men and women into put them in harm's way, and this was absolutely essential. I wanted to be reluctant, and we pursued that policy basically for the four years that I was there. 9-11 came along, and that changed things. Suddenly, we had a different uh, foreign policy, a different uh, uh, policy toward going after on a preemptive basis. I know Governor Schwarzenegger has a new book out uh, called Total Recall, uh, but he was the Terminator. And we had something of that Terminator um, um, mentality at that point. We've got to go after them wherever they are. Well, that has uh, some consequences, as we know, both in Iraq and still in Afghanistan. And we have learned uh, the limitations, actually, of the use of military power. It's not absolute. And just because we're still the strongest military in the world, there still are limitations on what we can do with that power. So we're finding that out as we have gone through a very uh, expensive uh, and, um, and very heartbreaking um, uh, experience for a lot of people. 
So what is our role today? We're not a reluctant sheriff. We're no longer in the Terminator mood as, as, as a mentality as well. Um, but are we part of an international posse? You know, we're, we're just one member of this international posse that's uh, charged with trying to maintain stability in various parts of the world. And uh, of course, uh, President Obama has been criticized by Republicans as, uh, quote, leading from behind. Uh, frankly, I think uh, he handled it correctly as far as Libya was concerned. You had another Republican called Bob Gates. And Bob Gates, uh, when the, the issue first surfaced, he said, we don't have a national security interest in what was going on in Libya. But along came our British friends and the French who said, but we do, and we need your help. And of course, the French and the British have been with us on every occasion for, uh, that we've been involved with. So there was pressure for the president to get engaged in Libya. And we did it in a way uh, that we utilized our main uh, strength, and that is our technology. No one else has the technology that we do. They don't have the stealth capability uh, and the ability to take down uh, air defenses in the fashion that we do. So we played a major role in helping to bring that about, even though the French and the British were the ones who were, quote, in the lead. We were really in the lead as far as the military operation was concerned. Then we turned it over to NATO. And we turned it over to NATO, and what happened? They ran out of ammunition pretty quickly, which raises another issue altogether in terms of the contributions that our NATO allies are making to the collective security uh, of NATO itself. But um, that was uh, one issue where we got to decide, what's our role in the world today? And exactly what kind of world are we talking about? It's changed. It's really changed rather significantly in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, Tom Friedman likes to write about this, but he, in one of his books, The World is, um, is Flat, he talked about how Columbus, thinking the world was flat, set out to sail to India, and he ended up here. And he found out the world was round. Friedman said, well, back in 2004, he flew to India, and he found that the world was flat. And it's both round and flat that technology has actually flattened the world in the sense that now everybody has access to the phones we just turned off. Uh, and has information in their hands. And so what that has done, uh, in Friedman's word, it's allowed people the world over uh, to cooperate, to collaborate, to compete, and to, quote, innovate. And that has both good news and bad news. On the positive side, we look at this thing, this is magic. I mean, when I was growing up, if you had access to the uh, encyclopedia, you were, you were doing pretty well. And if you had a whole set yourself, you were really doing well. Now you've got it in your hand. Now you've got all of the information that we once struggled to go to a library, take out cards uh, and sign out books. We now have it in our hands. So on the positive side, you have it right uh, here in California, Silicon Valley. That's the promise. You've got uh, you know, Samsung, and you've got uh, uh, Microsoft, and you've got uh, Oracle, and you've got all of these brilliant um, information technology engineers. Uh, and they are producing miracles. They're producing miracles uh, with, uh, with that technology. The downside of it is that because the world is now flat, the same people who have access, or who are the Bill Gates who creates this information, one of them, the same information is in the hands of bin Laden, the bin Ladens of the future. So that's the world in which we live because it's now flattened. We now have a different uh, world to contend with. And so we have to find a way to uh, reconcile what our role is going to be in a world that is shifting in terms of power, uh, in terms of the Arab Spring, now Arab Fall, uh, in terms of the Muslim world, in terms of the BRICS, you know, the Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. So we've got a different world to contend with now, and we have to try and reconcile what our role is going to be. And frankly, I don't think we have any choice but to remain engaged. Now, when I heard uh, Governor Romney today, he gave a very uh, fine presentation, I thought, but it sounded pretty close to where President Obama has been. Uh, minor differences, but nonetheless, there was almost a Kennedy-esque element to it. I don't know if you had a chance to listen to it today or to see it, but it was once pretty broad. You remember, I was influenced when I was in law school by uh, JFK, and I remember when he gave his inaugural address. You know, let every nation know whether they bear us uh, well or ill, uh, that we will pay any price, we'll uh, bear any burden, endure any hardship, defend any uh, friend, oppose any foe in order to ensure the success and survival of liberty. 
Oh, that was breathtaking. Could we say that today? Would the American people endorse that today? Because that pretty much was what was said today in terms of not quite so grandiloquent in terms of its scope. But I think that uh, Governor Romney was laying out a case uh, which I think was a positive one in the sense that there are elements inside my party that are uh, very isolationist. Uh, there are elements that say, time to come home. Forget about the rest of the world. Let's take care of, let's have some nation building right here at home. And so there, uh, there are elements of pulling and tugging on that to say, let's take care of us first and then we can worry about the world. And I thought that Governor Romney's statement today was pretty broad saying, no, no, we have to remain engaged in the rest of the world. And we can't walk away from the world because the world is not going to walk away from us. It's that simple. And so bad things happen when we're not engaged. And the question is, what form does that engagement take? Uh, with President Obama, he's tried to uh, approach it more on the diplomatic side, backed up by, uh, by a strong military. Uh, I think Governor Romney wants to be much more uh, aggressive on the military side uh, as opposed to the, the diplomatic. But it's hard to say at this point. But we have no choice. Uh, because uh, we can't come back to continental United States and wrap ourselves in a cocoon and watch the world unfold on CNN or MSNBC or Fox. Not going to happen. So uh, engagement is a, a, a requirement, and the question is, how do we deal with a world that's shifting and changing? We have less influence in the world than we did 15, 20 years ago. That's the reality. And there's not much you can do about it, say, to Egypt, to dictate to Egypt. They've had an election. They've got a new president. They may have new policies uh, that we'll have to see how it unfolds in Egypt. But it's not going to be the same relationship we had in the past. We will not have as much influence, excuse me, influence as we've had in the past. On one hand, that may, in the long term, may work out to, our, uh, to the betterment of, uh, of our relationship. They're struggling now to, quote, uh, put in place or institutionalize um, uh, rule of law, uh, trying to have some sort of uh, uh, code, commercial code, et cetera. But you've got to have institutions to build because what's happening in Egypt uh, can be reflected in other parts of the, the Middle East as well. You've got highly educated people who have no jobs. Uh, and so those are the people who went to the square. In Tahir Square, that's what we saw, young people out there demanding an overthrow uh, of an authoritarian uh, figure. But they wanted something more. They want, they want what we want. We want to have an economy that produces jobs for our young people and our people who are in the workforce and can hopefully we can retire and uh, enjoy uh, the rest of our lives. They want the same thing. So unless the Egyptian government, the president, and you now his, um, his leadership, unless he's able to generate that, there's going to be even uh, more turmoil in the region and in other parts of uh, the Middle East. So how do we cope with all this? We won't have as much influence. On the other hand, we still have to have some influence, so we still have to be engaged with the Egyptians. And it's not going to be, they won't say, um, make the statements that we may want them to make. They may not have the same relationship with Israel that we'd like them to have. Uh, the president of Egypt will have to figure that out in terms of whether or not he wants to really find a way to stabilize his country and have a stable relationship with, uh, with Israel and the rest of the neighborhood. That's going to be his choice and his people's choice. So, we don't have as much influence that we can say, you have to do this. We can try and shape uh, the uh, philosophy uh, and uh, the economy of, um, of other countries, but we can't dictate it. Uh, and that's what has changed. So how we go about dealing with Egypt, Syria is another major issue uh, on the agenda at this point. Um, do we support uh, the resistance in Syria? The answer is yes. Have we done so with what? Humanitarian assistance, intelligence. We have not poured arms into the region at this point because there are some pretty serious reservations about what that would mean. Certainly you have the Iranians playing a role. Their hand is there. The Russians certainly have a role. They've been providing the arms all these years to the uh, Syrians. Lebanon is also involved. Uh, now Turkey may be involved. So it gets very complicated and requires a lot of uh, diligence on our part to try to assess what the best course of, uh, of action for us is. Let me say a couple of words about, well, Iran. Uh, Iran is obviously uh, one of the central issues that are going to confront, that's confronting President Obama, confronting us, and will confront uh, Governor Romney should he uh, be elected. There aren't any good options with Iran. There are only three basic options. One, intensify the sanctions that we have been imposing 
trying to generate as much uh, international support for those sanctions uh, to try to persuade the Iranians that it's not in their long-term interest uh, to pursue a nuclear weapons capability. That's what we're doing now. Second option is to either encourage or take military action, either allow the Israelis, we have no choice over that, if the Israelis decide they want to go, they will go. But the question is, do we go with them or do we go instead of them? Uh, military action. Well, it has a lot of untoward consequences that uh, we, we know that uh, things can unfold from military operations which uh, can prove very uh, damaging to us globally uh, with the reaction that could be uh, produced uh, not only in the region but throughout the Muslim world. So that's something you have to take into account. What are the consequences for that? And the third option is live with an Iranian bomb. Now, I will say from my perspective, uh, the notion that Iran would ever launch a military attack uh, uh, or a nuclear attack upon Israel is pretty far-fetched if you're talking rationally on it, which may not be the case, because they would be destroyed almost immediately. Uh, the Israelis would respond uh, overwhelmingly. There would be a, a, a retaliation would be devastating. Uh, secondly, if they ever tried it against us, we know that what the reaction would be. So I don't see that as the major threat. The major threat is one of proliferation, namely if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, the other countries in the region also would have to have the nuclear weapon for deterrence purposes. So the Saudis, maybe the UAE, certainly Egypt at some point. So now you've got more and more countries having access to nuclear technology and materials. Uh, the chance of that getting out into the hands of the uh, radical groups becomes greater, putting us all in danger. So that's really the key element. Do we, do we try to contain the spread of nuclear weapons or do we say, well, everybody's entitled to one? Uh, and I think that's not a good option. So those are the only three options. I think we're pursuing the best one at the moment. And I think the president has been right to say, let's go as far as we possibly can on the diplomatic side and economic sanctions and try to persuade the Russians and the Chinese that it's in their interest to really intensify the sanctions against uh, Iran because they say publicly, and I believe them, and they say privately to me, they don't want to see Iran get a nuclear weapon. Okay, well, now's the time to see, take this action so it doesn't become a military operation. But that's, that's one of the real uh, dangers involved. Let me uh, turn quickly to, uh, to China and to the Asia-Pacific region. Um, again, there was a notion, um, Governor Romney talked about that the Europeans may be feeling abandoned, that we're, quote, pivoting uh, to the Asia-Pacific region. Number one, I've never liked the word pivot. Uh, number two, I don't like rebalancing. And three, I don't like that we're coming back to the Asia-Pacific region. We've never left. We've been there since uh, World War II. Uh, and as a result of our being there, that region has been stabilized. I uh, ran into this uh, back in the 90s and uh, when uh, there were a lot of uh, white papers coming out saying it was time for the United States to get out of the Asia-Pacific region, uh, that it was time for the Asians to take care of Asia. And I went and I addressed the Chinese Military Academy I said, you really mean that? You want us to leave tomorrow? And if we do, what happens? Nature abhors a vacuum. Uh, so does uh, geopolitics abhor a vacuum. Who fills it? Are you going to fill the security arrangement for all of the Asia-Pacific region? Do you think that uh, Japan will sit on the sidelines? India will sit on the sidelines? You will have great instability. And what happens when you have instability? Money takes off. Capital is a coward. Capital takes flight. All of this tremendous... Uh, economic reform that you have uh, enjoyed has been the result of us being there, frankly, and we're going to continue to be there. One final thing on, on, on China. The issue is the so-called ASEAN countries, the, uh, the uh, Asian countries of Southeast Asia, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Uh, they want us to have a bigger presence, not bigger in the sense of more military presence as such or bases. They want us to show that we're more engaged in the region. Why? Because, number one, they are trading with China. They are the number one trading partners with China. We used to be. We're number four now. But we used to be number one. But they want to continue to do business with China, and they will be doing more business with China. They don't want to be dominated by China. So they would like the United States to continue to show that we have a presence. And the president's plan, so-called pivoting or rebalancing, means that we'll show a little more presence by putting 2,500 troops, Marines, uh, in, uh, in Darwin. 
And now that's not going to result in a major balance of power shift with 2,500 Marines. I think the Marines are great, and I'm, I'm in a uh, wonderful institution right here, and the Secretary of State is just down below us, uh, also a former Marine. Um, Marine 2,500 is not going to mark a shift, but it does send a signal. Uh, and the fact is we're going to have a few more ships rotate through um, uh, Singapore. Not major combat uh, ships like aircraft carriers or 688-class submarines, big boomers as we call them, but a, a more of a presence. We're doing some more negotiating now about the Philippines. Vietnam, ironically, would like to have us have a lot more presence in the region. Why? Because the Chinese are getting stronger. That's inevitable. That's what Deng Xiaoping had always planned for, four modernizations, the last one being the military. So they are growing economically. They're number two economically. They're scheduled, if things continue on their current path, which is not a guarantee, uh, to be number one economy uh, in the next uh, 20 years. Uh, it may or may not take place, but they are building their economy and they're building their military. And uh, that is what is of concern to the other countries throughout the Asia-Pacific region, that they're now starting to flex some of the muscle that they've been developing. And they would like the United States to have a little more presence there. And that's what the presence program is really all about. So we say that rhetorically, but then you look down at the numbers on the budget, I don't see the budget there. So then what's the reality? And this is something that Governor, uh, Governor Romney has been addressing, saying, OK, we want to have a greater shipbuilding capacity. I'm from the state of Maine. We build ships in Maine. So that's, uh, that's something that uh, certainly uh, is um, well received in the state of Maine and, 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 and elsewhere. But then the question becomes, can we really, how do we pay for it? How do you reconcile spending more at the same time you're talking about getting control of the, the debt and the annual deficit, which is running 1.2 to 1.3 trillion a year? So these are the complex issues that we have to resolve, but our role in the world has to be one of engagement. There's just no, there's no uh, walking away from that. So China becomes uh, both an opportunity and a challenge. Uh, there's a great market there, as ch the Chinese have lifted some oh, 450 million people out of desperate poverty. Uh, you can see it along the Gold Coast of, of China, as we call it. Uh, inland, they've got desperate poverty, some seven, 800 million people who still live um, uh, very close uh, to the impoverishment uh, level. And so they've got a challenge. How do they raise that many people up into a middle class society? Is that good for us? Well, there's an opportunity that they need infrastructure, they need uh, things that we produce, so there are opportunities for uh, American and Western business as well. Challenge is to make sure that the Chinese, as they grow stronger, and become more militarily capable, that they don't use that military in a way to intimidate or threaten the other nations in the region. Therefore, there's an interest for us to strengthen our relationship with the Australians, with our small force in Darwin, to have a bigger or more frequent presence in Singapore, to perhaps get back into the Philippines, to strengthen our relationship with Japan, and also to build a stronger relationship between the United States and India. All of that is designed to make sure that the area remains stable. Now, the Chinese, as they look at it, would say, wait a minute, it looks to us like containment. What you're doing by putting a base down here, putting another base here, you're really trying to contain us. And the reality is that we can't contain China. It's too big, it's too strong, and it's uh, simply not doable. What we can do is persuade them through diplomacy, through our economic relationship, and that's why it's real important to have a good relationship with China, because both countries understand that uh, if we work together on some of the major issues, we can benefit. Uh, the last thing we want to do is start uh, engaging in a real hostile relationship with a, a country like China or with uh, Russia or the two of them, which is another issue coming up in the, in the campaign. Let me, uh, let me cease and desist here because I, I feel that I'm, I'm getting into my senatorial uh, mode. Uh, let me conclude with just a, a couple of uh, key rules for me, at least, as far as conclusion is concerned. Uh, freedom uh, cannot exist without order. Uh, and pretty simple, a river without a bank is not a river, it's a flood. So we have to have freedom, but we have to have some order. Uh, and that's both fiscally, especially fiscally. Uh, liberty uh, cannot uh, become license. Uh, we can't take our uh, liberty to the extent that uh, there are no rules uh, any longer, that anything goes, uh, that the rule of law is simply subsumed by uh, whoever happens to dominate at that particular moment. 
Uh, diplomacy can't be effective without a strong economy and without the military power to back up the diplomacy. And uh, the world can't be safe without the rule of law. Uh, those are pretty key elements that I think, um, at least for me, must be resolved as we move forward. And I would hope, once this campaign is over, which has gone on for the past three or four years, that uh, we can find a way to uh, reconcile differences. I must tell you, one of the reasons I left public office, I served 24 years on Capitol Hill. And uh, the, uh, the last few years became uh, disappointing to me. We were spending more time uh, in quorum calls, delays. Uh, you know, it was simply not an institution that was, uh, I found fulfilling at that point because we weren't doing anything. We were more interested in posturing against the other party than actually dealing with the issues confronting the country. And I just decided that uh, I'm half Irish and I have this internal clock that's always ticking or the sands uh, running through the, the hourglass in my mind. And I said, well, I've got uh, so many good years left and I think I'd rather try and do something uh, beyond the political realm to, to do something. And then, ironically enough, I had retired. I was on my way. I had just signed a lease uh, for a business office in downtown Washington and got a call from the White House saying, would you like to have, president, to have lunch with the president? And frankly, um, I had not, I didn't know him. I had shaken hands with him on several occasions. We said hello to each other but we really didn't have any kind of a friendship or relationship. And, and I had two meetings with him, and then uh, he basically offered me the chance to become Secretary of Defense. And I must tell you, out of 31 years of public service, the last four Secretary of Defense were the most rewarding, the most exhilarating, the most exhausting uh, in the best years of my life. And I tell you that because being uh, in that position with the, the men and women who serve us, uh, it's the most incredible experience that I could never hope to replicate in, in my lifetime. And being with them, being near them, it was to be inspired by them, to see their, their dedication, their patriotism, their selflessness, their initiation, all the things that make this country uh, great, you see it uh, in our young men and women who are serving us. So uh, I am always grateful to President Clinton for that opportunity. He uh, took a bold step, it never been done before. Uh, in terms of asking somebody from an elected official from the different party to come and serve in that capacity. And, um, and it worked out, I think it worked out well for both of us. Thank you very much. <laughs> You've got the microphone over there. While you're putting on your mic, I should note that one of the questioners um, asked about how to improve uh, the climate in Congress and noted that when you were there, it was more collegial. Um, she or he seems to be implying that there's a connection between your presence and collegiality. <laughs> well, it was starting to deteriorate, actually. Uh, um, I started in the House way back in 1972. I see all these young people here, and it's, uh, I should tell you, I went back to my 50th college uh, reunion uh, this past spring, and my oldest son um, will turn 50 in February. And so uh, when I say I started way back when, and actually, I don't know if it's in the program, but I actually ran for office by walking. And I walked all the way from New Hampshire to Canada on foot. And I stayed with different people uh, at picked at random in their homes in the evening. And what I decided to do was I was going to make myself available to every single family, regardless of their political affiliation. So there's an area in Maine, uh, in Lewiston, Maine, by way of example, that uh, heavily Democratic, probably 90%. And uh, I know I, when I started to campaign there, my Republican friend said, what are you doing? You're wasting your time. And I said, no, it's not a waste of time. And no Republicans ever won there. But I said, who are the, uh, the people in Lewiston? They were uh, Franco-American, heavily, uh, Catholic, um, hardworking, labor force, who had probably never seen a Republican uh, spend any time with them. Mm -hmm. And I went there, and I spent time in their homes. I talked to them. They have the same values that Republicans had. Uh, they they love their family, loved their country, loved their jobs, wanted to work, uh, were, uh, had strong religious ties. And I said, well, that's who we're talking to. And so it, I didn't carry the, uh, the city of Lewis in my first time. A couple of times after that, there was they voted for me. So it's just basically making yourself open to people, listening to different ideas. I've always taken the position as a public servant 
Uh, if a Democrat has a good idea, I want to embrace it. If Republicans do, I want that too. And that's the way I tried to conduct myself in those 24 years. But then I found what was taking place in the last few years. It was becoming much more partisan. And um, let me give you an example. The word today, compromise, has been poll tested. You will not hear um, public officials or politicians use the word compromise today. Why? Because it signals weakness. It signals lack of principle. So they use a different phrase now. It's called, let's search for common ground. OK, whatever we call it, that's what has to be done. That's not what's being done. And each party is planting its flag in the concrete of absolutism, that you're either on the left or you're on the right. And my fear what is taking place in our system is the middle is being hollowed out. People who are willing to put their hands across the aisle and say, OK, let's make a deal. I can't have everything that I want, but you can't have everything you want. Let's find something we can both live with. That process has been uh, in, in jeopardy. And anybody who's been willing to reach across the aisles had it cut off. You've had uh, people like uh, Senator Bob Bennett, really very strong conservative, really responsible conservative. Uh, his father was a senator. He was a businessman. He then became a senator, one of the best. Uh, he supported TARP. That was it. Got rid of him out of the party. And, uh, Richard Luger. A uh, great internationalist. Now, he had the age factor working uh, against him, but it wasn't the age so much as he was too willing to compromise on foreign policy issues. So if we do this, we end up basically almost with a parliamentary system without having a parliamentary system. And so we've got to come back to the center. I think that's what Governor Romney, frankly, is trying to do right now. I mean, if you, you, if you look what happened during the primaries, and this is, this is not unusual, candidates in both parties, Republicans move to the right, Democrats move to the left. And then once they get elected, you have to get closer to the center. If you're a Democrat, it's left of center, not far left, but left of center. If you're a Republican, right of center, but not far right. That's where you govern, somewhere around between the 40 yard lines. You know, that's, that's where you have to try to make accommodations because we're a tremendously diverse country with different uh, people, different, uh, different ethnicities, different religions. So you've got to find a way in this great diversity of ours to make it work. And I think that um, right now we're, we're at the polar extremes. And I think that, uh, that Governor Romney is trying to get back uh, to slightly uh, the right of center. And uh, I thought he did a pretty effective job uh, the other night. Uh, frankly, uh, the, the president was not on his game, and, and Governor Romney was. And I thought the speech today was an effort to say that he wants to be an internationalist. He's rejecting the far right that says, let's get out of foreign entanglements. Let's go back to what the founding fathers. It would be great if we could do that, except this is a different world. So yeah, we're involved in entanglements. And we, I think, are still the only force uh, for good that has the capacity to bring about positive uh, uh, reactions. I, I think a world without the United States uh, is one that's going to be fairly chaotic and, and not one we want to see. So uh, we have to be engaged. And the question is, how do we reconcile that with our budgetary problems? We have to reconcile ourselves to the point that we'll, we'll be doing less with less. You can't do more with less. We're going to do less with less. Now, can we do that? Yeah, we can, we can do that. We'll have to do that. So we have to then pick and choose. Where do we uh, become engaged militarily? Um, where do we um, you know, uh, look for other ways to have an influence and shape events? And so we have to be more discreet in terms of, um, of committing ourselves to long-term campaigns without understanding what the full consequences are. So uh, would I like to have more for defense? Any Secretary of Defense will tell you. But it's not how much. Uh, money you spend for defense, that's, that's important, but it's how you spend it. What are you spending it on? What's the future likely to look like? Uh, something, uh, i get a little technical here, but QDR, Quadrennial Defense Review, you go through it every four years. You try and identify what are the threats that are coming at us today, the ones that are likely tomorrow in the next 20 years. And once you try to identify those threats, then you say, how do we shape our force structure to deal with that? So that goes on every four years where you make these kinds of analyses and, and, and projections. Anyway, I'll stop here.
I'm just so, saying so it, was, me, it was partisan when I left. It's worse now. So, so let me let me hang on to a, the kind of issues that would appear in the quarterly defense review. Um, uh, the whole issue of cybersecurity, right. a, a modern day problem. I'm, I'm still with the the issue of um, of inability to compromise. The U.S. Senate failed to act on the cybersecurity bill. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was it, it was brought down in essence by a filibuster. Mm-hmm. Here's a national security priority, an economic security priority. Say a word about that. It's perhaps one of the, uh, the greatest threats that we face. Uh, I have always believed uh, that uh, a nuclear exchange would be uh, the worst nightmare that any of us could uh, encounter. In fact, I wrote a novel that came out last fall, uh, paperbacked out soon, uh, called uh, Blink of an Eye, in which I have a nuclear bomb that explodes and destroys the city of Savannah, Georgia. And the president then has to decide within about a four or five day period, who did this? How could they have done this? Why would they do it? And what do we do about it? Uh, Just to to try and dramatize the issues that confront us on the nuclear side. But nuclear, and, and any secretary of defense, any president will tell you that's our worst nightmare is a nuclear exchange uh, because of the, the devastation that would be involved. Second, of course, is um, biological warfare, but I put cyber warfare up there with all three of them now as as the big three, because you can, with uh, brilliant minds, shut down our infrastructure. Uh, And the problem is it's not so much the government. Uh, Most of the infrastructure is in private hands. So it's the private sector that has to be, number one, alerted to what the dangers are, number two, then has to work with the government to say, what do we do to enhance our capability against this kind of intrusion that's taking place uh, on a scale that's uh, unimaginable today? So to me, the cyber threat is, uh, is so significant that it was irresponsible to simply walk away and say, we'll get to it next, uh, next spring. Because number one, if President Obama is reelected, then well, he still has his national security team involved. But then the question is, what's Congress look like, the composition? If you have Governor Romney becomes president, he's got to have a whole new team. They have to go through the whole uh, process to put that in. So now we're six, eight months away. Uh, I don't think we can wait that long. I, I think it was irresponsible, and I think we've got to get back to that as a, a major threat that confronts us. So let me take a series of issues, because as you noted, Governor Romney made a major, gave a major foreign policy address today. In the debate, the first debate, mm-hmm. Jim Lair asked, do you differ? How do you differ? So I'm going to go through a few and ask you that question, sure. uh, as you've observed both candidates. Um, when it comes to Syria, uh, both candidates support having the Saudis and, the, and, and, and Qatar uh, arm, the, arm the rebels. Uh, is there a difference beyond, is, is there a difference between their views? Uh, I think that uh, Governor Romney went further on that issue, although not well defined in terms of providing assistance, weapon assistance uh, to the Syrian uh, resistance uh, forces. Didn't say that we would provide the weapons, but that weapons should be provided. I think that, frankly, that's being done by others, at least at the uh, smaller level. I don't know that he's prepared to commit us to committing major weapon systems to the Syrian force at this point. Uh, so I'm not sure there's that much of a difference. So, so the president's concern with regard to heavy weapons is that they'll fall into the wrong hands. Do we know? Um, what is the composition of the rebel forces? It's mixed. Uh, there are some elements of al-Qaeda uh, involved, uh, much as there were even in Libya. Uh, so there are people uh, who are looking uh, for ways uh, to take advantage of that. So you have uh, Sunnis uh, who certainly uh, want to see the Shia uh, influence reduced. Uh, you have elements coming in from Iran uh, who are now fighting against the Syrians. You have Leb- Le- Lebanese involved. So we don't have a, uh, there's not a cohesive fighting force at this point. So I think there's some, that's one of the reasons why we're providing intelligence and along with humanitarian assistance to try to make sure that uh, if we're providing weapons uh, to, uh, to elements that they're not gonna be turning around and falling into um, uh, the hands of terror groups or being used against us. Mm-hmm. So we have to be very reluctant. I mean, I think the president is wise in terms of uh, Syria, in terms of not committing us to war uh, in Syria, just as it's wise that not to commit us to war with Iran until you reach the absolute end point of diplomacy and economic sanctions. We've got two. We just got out of uh, uh, Iraq. We're still in Afghanistan. 
We spent a trillion uh, in Iraq. We're there close to that. We'll have spent a trillion in Afghanistan. So as we look at uh, what we're doing to our own military, I mean, look at the kids who are serving us. They're having four term tours, five tours. Uh, we're, we're taking a small group of American people who are serving in this, in this capacity, and we're using, they're over utilizing them. So we've got to take care to make sure we don't uh, undermine the, the, this, this great military, the greatest military in the world today is still the U.S. military, and we want to make sure that we husband uh, that, that military in a way that doesn't overcommit them. And I know there's been, I mean, there's always this issue. Uh, before you ever commit military force, there are two or three questions you have to ask. Number one, what is the mission? Specifically, what is the mission? Before I send your son or your daughter to put their lives uh, on the line, I want to know what the mission is. Is it achievable? Number one, can I define it? Number two, is it achievable? Number three, what are the costs? Blood and treasure. Number four, what's the exit strategy? How do we get out? Because we know one thing, once you commit to a, an engagement, Real easy to get in, real tough to get out. So those are issues that we have to always weigh, whether we're talking Syria, Iran, any country. Uh, we have to ask those questions, and we haven't been uh, asking them enough, I think. Uh, I think the president is right. I don't think that Governor Romney disagrees with that. I think he rhetorically sounds like there's a difference. I don't think there's much of a difference other than I think uh, what he is saying, let's be more aggressive, let's, uh, let's get respect and rather have respect and fear than, uh, than uh, weakness through uh, diplomacy. But I, I think we've learned that uh, there are limitations to our power. Uh, and so we can use it, but we have to use it in the right way. And uh, anyway, I'll stop there. You've taken us to Iran. So I'll ask this questioner asks whether war is inevitable with Iran. Um, I'd, I'd ask a, a more long-term question. Is Iran a status quo state? Were it to acquire a nuclear weapon, would we imagine it would be for deterrence purposes only, or do we imagine a more uh, aggressive uh, role? Rule number one, nothing is inevitable until it happens. Okay, Nothing is inevitable. We, we, um, we are still in charge of events and things uh, that are not totally out of our control. So nothing is inevitable. Number two, Iran is a revolutionary state. They are not going to be satisfied with just maintaining the status quo. The, the, the reason that they're maintaining their power is they're revolutionary, and they want to spread that revolution to other parts of the, uh, the region. Uh, as a result of uh, what's happened in Iraq, Iraq is closer to Iran than before. They were at war at one point, and we were actually helping them against uh, Iran. Um, but uh, now the barriers are down. Um, um, President Maliki is uh, closer uh, to Iran. The Iranians have a bigger influence today. Uh, and that's not uh, to our, you know, it does not serve us or anybody in the region to have that kind of, um, of influence. But uh, that's the reality of where we are today. So I think they'll continue to spread their, or try to spread the revolution. That's why other countries in the region, UAE, uh, has requested a major arms package from the United States. That's why the Saudis have requested a major arms package. Why? Because they're worried about Iran becoming much more expansionist, much more revolutionary, trying to dictate and topple their governments. So that's the tinderbox that we're looking at over in the Middle East, and that's why it's really important for us to impress upon, I say China, because we always talk about the U.S. playing the China card. I think it's time for China to play the China card. You see, I think that uh, China is in a position to go to the Iranians and say, we're serious. Uh, you know, we get oil from you, and that's real important to us. Uh, but we don't want to see you get a nuclear weapon. They've said this publicly. They've said it privately. They know what the consequences could be long term if Iran gets nuclear weapons. So I think they're in a position quietly to go to the Iranians and say, no, we're serious, and we're going to join for more intensive sanctions against you. Uh, that certainly is not going to uh, bode well for, for, your, for you or for your leadership or your country. I think the Russians have the same obligation. And um, if the Chinese were involved, I think the Russians would, uh, would similarly be involved. Because the Russians don't want to see them get a nuclear weapon. So here we have every country, India, uh, China, Russia, us, Germany, France, et cetera, Great Britain, all saying, let's not uh, get a nuclear weapon. Um, but I think China has a major role to play because I think the Iranians think if they can split the UN Security Council, 
then they are home free. That China will not support the United States, uh, Russia won't support the United States, they'll be able to continue to do what they're doing, and they'll bear the penalty in terms of the economic sanctions. Although you've seen this week, those sanctions are biting harder and harder against the Iranian economy. I think if they bite hard enough, Iran might uh, recalculate and say, uh, we've made our point, and we have the intellectual capability to develop these uh, systems. We're not going to do so. We're instead going to use it for peaceful nuclear purposes. And the Russians have given the, uh, the Iranians a perfect uh, opportunity to do that. We have all said, you have a right to develop nuclear power for civilian and peaceful purposes. And the Russians have said, we'll reprocess, we'll enrich the uranium. Uh, and so we'll uh, control it. You'll get the power that you need to produce pharmaceuticals and whatever else you want to produce. And the Iranians have said no. Uh, so I think that the Russians and the Chinese can really come in, and if they do so, you won't see the kind of military confrontation that the Israelis have been threatening and might one day feel they have no choice but to execute. Again, the, the two candidates on Iran. President Obama has uh, come up with the strongest sanctions we've ever had in the history of our country. Um, what Governor Romney said today is he wants stronger sanctions. Is there any difference between the Well, wanting candidates? them and getting them is two separate things. I mean, we've been pretty successful to date uh, in getting sanctions imposed against the Iranians, uh, having uh, the Europeans, certainly, who had a much closer relationship to, uh, to Iran than, than, than we have, uh, getting the Chinese to sign on to them, getting the Russians to sign on, not the one, as intense as we would like, but this one thing to say we're going to get more intense uh, sanctions, uh, you have to get them. Uh, and I think that uh, only through diplomacy will that take place, and then there's that, there's that threat that's out there. The Israelis keep looking at it, they see things differently than we do. They're closer. And so they're looking uh, existentially at a threat that is very close to their borders. So they have a different timeline. They have a different, um, uh, different reaction to all of this. They say, it's great for you, you know, I said, you're way over here, we're right here. So they feel the pressure much more intensely and they might feel compelled. Even though there's great disagreement in Israel, there's great disagreement um, in the military, with their intelligence uh, officials, uh, that this is not a wise thing to do at this time. You saw the 60-minute piece a couple of weeks ago. The former head of uh, Mossad said it would be unwise for them to take military action, he said at this time, because there are other things that can be done to forestall what the Iranians are seeking to do. So I don't think that, um, that Governor Romney is prepared to say, I would urge the Israelis to take military action. I will green light and say, whatever you want, uh, we will support. Uh, I don't think he's, he's gone that far, and frankly, I hope he doesn't go that far, uh, because uh, I think we have to be in charge of, uh, of when we're being committed uh, to a, another military campaign and not have somebody else make that determination for us. We have to work with the Israelis, and frankly, I've said this publicly, it's uh, no secret for me, uh, I would hope that if the Israelis ever decide they're going to take military action, that we are advised of this appropriately. Uh, and it's not a solo operation on their part with no notice to us. We have real, uh, real issues involved, real people at risk, real consequences that we will have to bear. So I hope, because they are our ally and a strong ally, that we always act in concert in terms of making sure you don't, we don't get blindsided by something where we have long-term consequences uh, and immediate consequences involved. The Israelis publicly have said, well, they won't commit to telling us because they want to insulate us against the, uh, the criticism that uh, we are the ones who are uh, urging them to do it. I don't accept that. I think that they have to keep us apprised whatever they're going to do in the future. In the region, would it be really seen as a distinction without a difference, whether the attack was an Israeli attack with our so. support or without? No, I think it'll be, I think the United States will, whatever takes place, will be held uh, as the party who either encouraged it or could have stopped it. So I think that uh, whatever action is taken, we will be uh, seen as the principles involved. Um, with respect to the, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian relationship and the possibilities for peace, there are two ways in which Governor Romney has, has differed with um, everyone who's been, been president thus far. One is that he's, he's referred to Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Uh, and, and two, he seems to have distanced himself from the notion that uh, a peace agreement would be based on the pre-'67 uh, borders. Um, 
Say well, something about that. What is your expectation should Governor Romney become president? Well, he has said that he would um, uh, recognize uh, Jerusalem as being the capital. Uh, we have always said, we, the Republican and Democratic administrations have always taken the position this is subject to negotiation as far as the peace agreement. And I think that's the, the wiser course of action rather than to uh, dictate that or declare that at this point. Uh, but today he said uh, in his um, presentation that he favored a two-state solution. I think that's the first time that uh, he has said that. Um, and frankly, I, I've been out on front on this for a long time. Uh, I think uh, there absolutely has to be a Palestinian state. Uh, it has to, I mean, look at the Palestinians. You say, what do the Israelis need? The Israelis need security. They cannot have a hostile nation on their borders uh, in a position to rain uh, warfare down on their heads in a, in, within seconds. And so that's a given. They need security. Palestinians, what do they need? They need sovereignty. They need uh, dignity. They need economic opportunity. Uh, and uh, I think that is the essence of what has to come about through a peace process. Frankly, I'm more discouraged about it than ever. Uh, I have not seen much progress being made. Tomorrow I will see my friend uh, George Mitchell. He and I are going to, I guess, debate uh, tomorrow. George Mitchell um, uh, is one of the most serious-minded, one of the most capable uh, individuals I've ever known. Um, he certainly was successful uh, in northern Iran, uh, Ireland, rather. Uh, and he said something. I was there the day that President Obama picked him uh, to be the envoy to the Middle East. Senator Mitchell got up and said, well, during the, the negotiations with Northern Ireland, there was something like 730-odd days of uh, no and one day of yes. And that was an indication he was prepared to sit there as long as necessary. Well, he sat there for almost two years and finally gave up. Uh, saying it's time to turn it over to somebody else because no one was making any movements. The Palestinians were not putting their act together. You didn't have a united or unified front. The Israelis were not uh, willing to give up uh, much during that process, so you had both parties staying exactly where they are today. Um, so I'm not that optimistic. I think it's important. I think it's imperative there be a two-state solution because otherwise uh, Israel will no longer be a... Um, a, a democratic state in the sense that uh, one man, one vote, because the, uh, the Arab population will soon outnumber them substantially. And if you get one man, one vote, then uh, obviously that's not going to work to their interest. So this is not me talking. This is Ehud Barak. Ehud Barak, who was the former, he is the defense minister today. He was the former prime minister. He came to the United States and said, we are facing, if we don't do this, being uh, an apartheid country. Now, Jimmy Carter got in a lot of trouble for using that word. But it, uh, here you have Ehud Barak, who has said, unless we have a two-state solution, we're going to end up as an apartheid state where you'll have Palestinians over here with fewer rights than Israelis have here. So that, uh, that's something they have to contend with. And hopefully, um, over the next, well, I keep hope is it springs eternal. I, I hope so. The uh, we, time is, is close to run up, so I ha run out, and I haven't had a chance to ask you about Pakistan, which is probably the hardest foreign policy and national security problem. Do you have a word to say about that before I turn to the last question? I think you described it. It's the hardest problem we have to contend with. Uh, it's very fragile. It's a, it's a very difficult situation where the Pakistanis, um, they, are, they have terrorist groups within. Uh, they still fear the, the relationship with India. They've had several wars fought uh, with India. Um, and so on the one hand, uh, they, they are a, quote, democracy, but in very fragile situation economically and politically. Uh, they, uh, they have challenges from within. And of course, we, have, we are challenged, have challenges we're imposing from without because we're launching uh, strikes into Pakistan. Uh, so that creates internal problems for them. And when we kill people, even um, we kill terrorists, but we kill innocent people as well, so-called collateral damage. That creates enormous problems for them. Uh, I think that uh, they were trying to preserve uh, uh, their sense of authority when we were able to kill bin Laden. Uh, that was a mission carried out uh, without their knowledge. And so you have a US force going into their space, taking out bin Laden, which we all hail, 
uh, as a major success. I'll tell you one other quick story about Pakistan, and I'll yield the floor to a question in the audience. We tried to get bin Laden as well in, in the Clinton years. Uh, we had only one, basically, what we thought was a clear shot. Uh, and it wasn't very clear. Because at that time, you may recall, in, uh, we had no bases anywhere in the region. We didn't have any base in Afghanistan. We didn't have any bases in Pakistan. We didn't have any bases in Kazakhstan, anywhere. So we were basically out in the ocean. And we had some intelligence that came through that said bin Laden is going to be at this place in Afghanistan. Well, you say, well, how long is he going to be there? Because he has a, you know, his modus operandi was to keep moving every few hours. Well, you can't fire a missile from hundreds of miles away uh, if the person is going to be moving all the time. So we had to have some pretty good intelligence that he was going to be at a certain spot. Uh, well, problem. How do you fire a missile to take out bin Laden in Afghanistan without overflying Pakistan? And that's the problem we had to, uh, to contend with. And fortunately, we had General jo uh, Joseph Ralston, who happens to be, um, he was the vice chair of the Joint Chiefs. He's now the vice chair of the Cohen Group uh, as well. Um, but uh, we sent him on a mission. Uh, to, to Pakistan to meet with his counterpart, have dinner. And um, he, he was there and was there when our missiles are flying over uh, Pakistani territory. Now, the risk for that was if we didn't have him there sitting there, if the Pakistanis detected missiles coming over, they would have to know where they're coming from. Are they coming from India or where? And so there are real dangers involved. So we've tried to on the one hand, deal with Pakistan in terms of treating them as a, obviously a democratic country that's an ally of the United States. At the same time, not want, be willing to risk compromising a mission such as bin Laden. So it created enormous problems internally for them. Uh, and they were embarrassed by it. Uh, and so they were trying, and they've, they've done some things, taken some actions which haven't uh, presented them in a very positive light with us. So the issue is, how do we contend? How do we still deal with this country? Because a failed Pakistan is not in anybody's interest. So we, we've got to continue to engage them, even though uh, there are things that are said and done uh, that we don't like and want to discourage them from engaging. And nonetheless, this is what diplomacy is all about. This is why it's so hard. Uh, this is why you can't reduce it to sound bites and you can't just declare, I'm for this or for that. You have to say, how complex is it? And what are the, what are the things we have to do to try to uh, resolve it? Anyway. I'm going to end with a question that, that flows wonderfully from the first question. Okay. And that question uh, comes from a younger person asking, how can we restore uh, young people's enthusiasm about public service, be it serving in the, as a civilian in government, serving in the military, public service overall? Well, number one, uh, get involved in the public process, process, the political process. Go work uh, for either a local candidate in the, uh, the city council. I started off as a, um, as a city council. Well, I started off before that, but I ran for the city council. I was elected to the school board, and I was elected mayor uh, in a small city, Bangor, Maine. But that, uh, that's what I did as a, young, uh, as a very young man. So I got involved at the local level, and then an opportunity came for me to run for office at the higher level, and was fortunate enough to get elected. But to the young people who are here, to the ones who are either watching or listening, uh, get involved. This is your country. And uh, you can say it's all, you know, it's all polarized and it's uh, something I don't want to get involved with. Well, uh, people will make decisions whether you're involved or not. You'd rather make, you, be involved and help them make the right decision. So young people have an obligation to get involved at the earliest age uh, as possible. Volunteer. Do whatever you can for a candidate that you think uh, supports uh, the values that you share and then eventually run for office and make sure that we're accountable. The other thing is make sure that we stay accountable, that if we say something, you hold us to it. And this is one thing you have to be careful of We're watching presidential campaigns. Be careful what you say. Uh, understand that you have to appeal to quote your base, but you can't make statements that you are then going to have to reject once you get in office because it undermines your credibility if you don't uh, adhere to them. So, uh, I think uh, find a candidate uh, that, uh, that, uh, that you support at the state level, local level, at the uh, um, senatorial, congressional level, and the uh, presidential level. Get involved. Please join me in thanking former Secretary William Cohen. Thank you.